up, guys? My name is Caleb. Thank you so much for checking out the OTK Podcast. And this is the show where we discuss anything and everything that is shaping our world today. We're going to be discussing the issue of freedom of speech. And we are proposing the question, will there be free speech in America 20 years from now? Now, I know that that may seem a little bit over the top to some of you guys, a little melodramatic, but I think after I share some of the stories that we're going to talk about today, it may change your mind a little bit because a year ago, I probably would have agreed with you uh, that we weren't at any true risk. But as I've gone down the, uh, the rabbit hole of information, I've become more and more concerned. So we're going to go ahead and jump into our very first story on this topic, and that is the story of Professor Jordan Peterson. In 2016, he was a professor of psychology at the University of Toronto, and he got a lot of attention because he released a, uh, a series of, of talks that he did in his class, the same way he releases uh, each week's talks uh, as they come out. But he was talking about uh, the Canadian B bill uh, BC-16, which if you don't know, was a bill that was proposed that would add uh, gender expression and identity to the list of uh, non-discriminatory groups under the Canadian Human Rights Act. So basically the same way that African Americans are protected, they would add those that uh, express themselves or identify in a gender role differently than others. And what his point was, is that combined with other laws that you could basically cause people to lose their job if they weren't willing to call people by the gender pronoun that they preferred. And things got a little bit crazier in Canada on this topic as the issue of gender fluidity uh, came to the forefront. In case you don't know, there is a kind of a subset of transgender people that consider themselves gender fluid, which means that every day they say that they feel like a different gender. You know, on Monday, I'm a guy. And then on Thursday, you know, things shift and I feel like a woman and that's how I want to identify. And so the problem that these people were finding was that, you know, they would tell somebody, oh, I identify as a man and they would be called him and then they would change, and then all of a sudden everybody was still calling him him, and they were wanting to identify as her. And so they were proposing these new gender uh, pronouns called Z and Zer. I'm not making this up. Z and Zer. That way they could kind of fluctuate their gender, and you would have pronouns that were gender neutral. That way no one was assuming their gender. And Jordan Peterson's point was just how crazy the entire thing was that you shouldn't be able to compel people to use particular words based on your preferences. And he even fell a lot more liberally on this scale than I think a lot of conservatives would. He said, you know, in, in, a, in an online video with a conversation with a student, he said, listen, I'm willing to call people by whatever pronoun they want. The difference is I don't want the government to mandate that I do that. I want to do it out of respect to the individual. I don't want to be fined and locked up if I don't. And things got really bad for, for Mr. Peterson. Uh, he was investigated by the university for hate speech and hate crimes. He had uh, giant groups of picketing students outside of, of the university. People were calling him racist and a bigot and a Nazi and all of these crazy things. And you might think, well, that was a couple of students at his university. Like how big a deal is it? Well, in the academic community, things got so bad that another college in Canada, um, I'm sorry, WLU in 2017 called in a teacher's assistant and reprimanded her for just playing a short clip of one of his speeches. And she wasn't even saying that she agreed with what he had to say. She was just simply presenting his ideas. And now she was one smart lady. She had enough forethought to uh, record the conversation. And in that conversation, the uh, let me read this, make sure I get it right. The Gender Violence Prevention and Support Officer, which is an actual position at the university, um, basically compared... Jordan Peterson to Hitler. I'm not making this up. This guy is pretty mainstream conservative. And they said that by showing one of his talks, uh, it was basically like showing one of Hitler's speeches. That just seems crazy to me that, that you would compare just a mainstream conservative voice to Hitler. But that, as you're going to learn in our uh, later stories, that's not that uncommon. But you might be thinking, okay, but what does that have to do with America? Canada has always been more liberal than the United States. That's not abnormal or weird. How does that 
mean anything for us. And what a lot of people don't understand is that uh, liberal ideas have a tendency to go kind of from Europe and trickle down to Canada, and then they make their way from Canada down to us. And so you'll literally, literally see like a 50 year correlation in between where Europe is and where America is. And so it's something that you need to pay attention to, but it isn't an isolated thing just to Canada. You know, uh, the next story that I, I wanted to talk about was in 2017, uh, there was a professor at Evergreen State College in Seattle, a liberal professor. Um, his name was Brett Weinstein. And this guy was very liberal. I mean, he was not shy about his support for Bernie Sanders or Occupy Wall Street. In an interview, he was asked what his political affiliation was, and he described himself as deeply progressive. But uh, even being on the left did not save him when uh, the day of absence came around. In case you're unfamiliar, uh, Evergreen State has what they're calling uh, the day of absence, and it was a tradition since the 70s where the school gave an excused absence to African-American students to be able to congregate somewhere else other than campus. And it was designed to show all the other races what life would be like without African-Americans there. Um, and Brett Weinstein was even a supporter of this. He said, hey, it's a great way to demonstrate your, um, your race's importance and a great way to, to peacefully show your opinion and the importance of, of who you are. But everything got a little bit messier when, uh, in 2017, a group of black activists got together and said, you know what, instead of the black students leaving, we think the white kids should have to leave and the minorities should get, should get the campus. And the school kind of signed off on it. It wasn't mandatory from the actual university, but the university allowed them to publish a big thing uh, in the student newspaper, allowed them to put up posters, and there was a lot of pressure on white students from their uh, fellow um, members to, to not show up because they were white. And Brett Weinstein, when he found out, was like, this is absolutely absurd. You can't ask people not to come to college that day because they're white. This isn't, this isn't right. And you would assume that the statement that racial segregation on campus is a bad thing is about as safe a statement as somebody can make, but it caused all kinds of problems. There was literally a violent mob outside of his classroom door. There's a video online of where they're screaming and very aggressive, uh, aggressively calling him a racist and a bigot and all of these things. And the college was absolutely unwilling to back him up, even though literally all he was saying was you can't kick out white kids uh, and tell black kids that they're the only ones that can come. That's not right. The college was unwilling to back him up. His wife actually ended up getting fired. He was investigated, although um, he didn't end up getting fired. Um, but there were even liberal news outlets that were covering it like he was the issue, like he was the problem because he was saying that racial segregation is not a good thing. So, and that was in Seattle at a liberal university with a liberal professor. And he still wasn't safe from this issue of free speech. I mean, people just absolutely raked him over the coals. And it wasn't an isolated incident. You look at people like James Damore, who worked for Google. He published a memo where he basically said that there was a difference between the genders and that we needed to be careful with all of this diversity training that they were requiring him to go to and through at Google, you know, about what that could end up being. And it was a very tame, like nothing over the top about this memo as far as I was concerned. And they ended up firing him to make an example of him because they were saying that it went against their employee uh, uh, guidelines to say that gender was biological and that there were differences between men and women. And the whole thing just seems so Orwellian. It seems so over the top that, that you have a company like Google that is willing to fire people for having just the most uh, baseline belief system. Now, I, I know what you're thinking, okay, well, that's a private organization, and I get that. Even the story with, uh, with Steven Crowder recently, where Twitter approached him asking him to do an ad for his Twitter page, and he said, well, you know, I don't, I don't know much about the algorithms and how ads work, so I'm not really interested in buying an ad at this time. And they said, they said well, let us make the ad for you. Uh, you just pay us. We'll create the copy for the ad. We'll release it. We'll promote it. You don't have to do anything. So uh, Steven Crowder's team, who is, he's obviously a conservative voice in this space, although he and I uh, disagree about how to go about that. Uh, he's conservative. And so he turned out a conservative ad, as you might have guessed, for his show. They approved it. They created it. 
They were the one that did the copy, like I said. And then after a while, they came and pulled his ad and said, well, this is against our community guidelines. And he emailed back and said, what are you talking about? You made this ad. You approved it all. Your team was the one that created this thing. How can you pull it? And they said, well, you know, it goes against our policies. There's nothing we can do. We're going to pull the ad. And so he's like, okay, you know, whatever. I just want my money back because I'm, I'm not going to pay for an ad that, that isn't running anymore because you didn't take the time to, to, to know whether this was for or against your, your uh, community guidelines. And they said, nope, we're going to keep your money and uh, you're not welcome here. It was more or less the, the basis of the conversation. And he provides the email on his show where he talks about it. But that is predatory business practices. That's fraud. You can't just go and say, hey, you know, we'll take your, uh, we'll take your money and then we're going to pull your ad. And that's exactly why Steven Crowder, if everything happened the way that he said it did, um, is going to be suing and a, and a whole thing. Um, but obviously that is private organizations. No matter how dishonest, um, if they really did what he said, allegedly, um, that's incredibly dishonest and that's wrong. Um, but it doesn't just stop there. You see, uh, Ben Shapiro is a good example. He came and did a, uh, was scheduled to do a talk at UC Berkeley. And there were riots on campus. They started fires and smashed car windows and assaulted people, did hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of damage in the protest just because they didn't want a conservative to come and speak. And, and you might think, okay, well, sometimes there are riots. Surely the school didn't support it. But a school official, when asked about it, said that violence was just as legitimate a response to the ideas that Ben Shapiro espouses as any other. All right? We're talking about somebody that is not fringe, right? We're not talking about Richard Spencer here. We're talking about Ben Shapiro, who is mainline conservative, and they were burning the school to stop him from speaking. They were, were literally getting in front of the doors and not allowing the students that were there to hear him to get into the auditorium. They were pulling fire alarms and all of these things, and the school didn't seem to have much of a problem. In fact, then came and were like, oh, well, we don't want Ben Shapiro to ever speak again. And this was UC Berkeley. In the past, they've been known for kind of a hub of free speech, even when it isn't popular. And so when you put these things together, that's why you need to be concerned about, uh, about free speech. Because when you have, look, look at the situation, you have a two-pronged issue. You have the people that are controlling the means of technology and communication. So you look at, this breeds into, uh, we've been hearing stories about Facebook, and obviously we've already heard about Twitter um, and Instagram and all of these companies that are trying to silence and demonetize, you know, like YouTube has been demonetizing conservative uh, and even not just conservative, but center personalities. You look at people like Ben Shapiro, I'm sorry, not Ben Shapiro. When you look at people like Philip DeFranco, who I'm a huge fan of, uh, they demonetized almost all of his videos. And in case uh, you don't know, demonetization is the process where they take away the money that they usually would pay you for ads because they consider you too controversial. And usually that originally was supposed to be used to stop people like the Klan or uh, Nazis from getting on there and big brands being advertised next to their videos. But now it's bled into people like Philip DeFranco who fall about dead center politically and are the farthest thing from what somebody like me would call conservative. But he doesn't fall to the extreme far left. And so they've literally demonetized almost all of his videos. And that's the terrifying thing is, you know, Google owns YouTube and Google and YouTube make up number one and number two of the most popular uh, search engines in the world. And then when you couple that with Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, and they all fall on the same ideological lines. Now, some of them are more aggressive about enforcing anti-conservative and anti-center uh, philosophies, but they all have made it clear where they stand in opposition to beliefs like mine. And so when you consider that they control the way that this next generation is communicating, the way that they're searching for information, that's scary. And then when you put the second issue in of education, right? UC Berkeley is a huge school with a lot of uh, credible people that have come out of there as far as, as the center is concerned. A lot of people, it's a bragging point to say that you went to Berkeley University. And so when you see large universities that used to be kind of the hubs of free speech now having huge riots when just regular conservative Republicans come and speak, you need to pay attention. 
And you might be saying, okay, well, how does this affect free speech just because a private organization like social media or a university is having these kind of problems? Well, you got to think that, that if the extreme far left is controlling the way that people are looking for information and communicating. And then you have universities that are obviously uh, teaching people that you should be allowed to silence ideas that you do not like. Understand that this next generation of those extreme far left people are going to make up a large chunk of the voting populace. And they don't just want to silence you, they think violence is okay. Just like we talked about uh, the official saying that violence to Ben Shapiro was a reasonable response. Even the Huffington Post, after Trump had won, came out with an article that flatly said, listen, uh, any Democrats that say that violence isn't a, a reasonable way of dealing with Donald Trump is wrong. And that's the only way that we're going to fight him. I'll make sure to link that, uh, that article down below. So when you think that a chunk of the far left wants to hurt you, right? You think about Twitter. Uh, hashtag punch a Nazi was trending on Twitter not that long ago. And it was this entire idea that if you think somebody is racist or a Nazi, it's your job to punch them. And that was trending on Twitter. Like you think about how far we have come in just the last 15 years. So if there is a chunk of voters that think that they should be allowed to be violent to you if they don't like what you have to say, and then you have another chunk of people just want to strip you of your free speech in general, Think about the position that like a moderate Democrat politician is going to be in. If a chunk of his demographic wants to hurt you over your ideas and the other chunk wants to take away your freedom of speech because they think it's hate speech, where is that person going to be left? Taking away your First Amendment rights, labeling it, you know, bigotry or hate speech is going to be a compromise, right? He's going to sit down with Republicans and say, listen, uh, I have a chunk of my people that, that want to hurt you. Taking away your ability to say that gender is biological is the best compromise that I could possibly get for you. And so we need to pay attention to these kinds of things. You know, we didn't even talk much about it, but even large social e-commerce sites like Amazon, you listen to their CEO and he's just as uh, in line with uh, the people running Twitter and other social media sites. And so when they are running some of the largest organizations in the world that have some of the largest incomes in the world, you can't ignore these kinds of things. But to be fair, I did want to take a second and uh, kind of turn it on the right because I've been talking up until this point about the far left, but it's important that if we are going to be pro-free speech that we can't be hypocritical about it. So what does that mean? For me, as a conservative, if you, if you want to say that you are pro-free speech and that you don't believe that people should be silenced because they're popular, their opinion's unpopular, you need to look at the kind of media that you are supporting. So what do I mean by that? I find it difficult to believe that people are free speech if they are willing to, to listen to news correspondents on major conservative networks that invite people onto their show that obviously disagree. They only give them like a three to five minute segment and then they spend the entire time yelling at them while they're st why they are stupid or saying that they don't understand or, or in a very unethical way, cutting their interview to make them look uh, less intelligent or more confused on the show than they actually are. And I see a lot of mainstream conservative organizations that are doing exactly that. You know, Bill O'Reilly is not, uh, not broadcasting anymore after all of his scandals, but I would watch his show. He wouldn't even let people speak and say, no, 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 you just need to shut up because you don't understand. That is not, that is not pushing free speech forward. You can disagree with somebody. You can say that, that you don't think that they have a good grasp on the ideas that they are presenting. But we as conservatives can't shut down people because we think that they're too far left. We have to be willing to let them speak and let the world know what it is that they believe because that's the best way to combat a belief that you don't agree with is to let them state it. And if it really is as ridiculous as you claim it is, it'll be revealed in that conversation. And the other side of this has to do with conservative and Christian universities. You see, I'm giving a hard time to UC Berkeley because they're trying to shut down people like Milo Yiannopoulos and Ben Shapiro for coming to speak. But I've never heard of a conservative college, specifically a Christian college, that ever allowed somebody from the far left to come and do a debate with one of their professors. And, and maybe I'm ignorant, maybe I don't know. Comment in the comment section down below if you're watching on YouTube and let me know if you've had a different experience. But I know I went to a conservative Christian college 
who never once, the entire time I was there, ever had somebody in that disagreed with the main teachings of the school. In fact, we had a, uh, a strong uh, pro-gay organization picket outside of our school, and we were told in chapel, in assembly, do not engage them, do not talk to them, and especially if they have cameras, don't respond to any of their questions. And I get that the school is trying to protect their students, but that's not what you're doing. When you limit people from exposures to ideas that you disagree with, you are simply arming the opposite side. Because at some point, they're going to get cornered by those people, and they're going to get questions. And then they're going to say, well, didn't you ever think about this? And they say, oh, well, I never heard that point of view before. And then that side is going to use the fact that they've never heard it as to convince them to why they're wrong. Oh, well, of course, the right, right didn't want you to hear this because they knew they didn't have an answer for it which may very well not be true. You may have just not wanted them to, to be swayed by that opinion, and so you didn't talk about it, you didn't address it, and you may very well have an answer to it, but the left, the extreme left, I'm sorry, is going to tell them that the reason that this was never brought up was because we know that we're wrong. And so when you limit the availability of ideas that are contrary to your own, you are only shooting your own movement in the foot. And so you have to think about these things before you do them. You have to think about, okay, what debate can we open up? What conversations can we have? And I'm not saying that you should invite a Nazi apologist to come onto your campus and do this speech and go unchallenged. I'm saying you should challenge their idea. You should, you should explain to the student campus live why none of this makes any sense and let them have a chance to respond. But there's going to come a day where the conservative ideals are considered Nazism. That's going to be considered the worst that the world has to offer. And we have to be prepared. Even though we aren't bigots and all of these things that they describe us as, unfortunately, we are going to look like those things if we never engage anyone that we disagree with. So this, I, well, we're going to end this podcast, but I want to hear what you have to say. What do you think about Professor Peterson? What do you think about uh, uh, the fact that he's making statements that, that gender is biologically set and it is not a social construct. What do you think about Brett Weinstein saying that, that schools should not be racially segregated, which seems like a safe thing to me. Uh, but what do you think about the school's response and firing his wife and all of these things? Uh, what do you think about free speech? Is it going to exist in America in 20 years? Do you think that we have the tolerance and the patience to be able to endure ideas that we disagree with? Or are you genuinely worried the way that I am that our kids may not have the same civil liberties that we have enjoyed and taken for granted all of this time. I want to hear what you have to say. I want to engage with you guys. Uh, so if you are listening to this as a podcast, make sure to jump onto our Facebook page, our Instagram, or our YouTube and make a comment. Let me know. Or if you're watching it on a platform with video, make sure to comment down below. Uh, like and subscribe to all of our channels. If you like what we do here and you want to support us, check out our Patreon page. That's the way that you uh, will to ensure that we are able to keep doing uh, what we are doing and pushing forward this message of, of having a conversation conversation with people, even though we disagree with them, or you can check out our merch store. We sell one true King t-shirts and you can support us that way. Well, thank you guys so much for listening to this podcast. We love you very much. Hopefully in the weeks to come, we'll have um, some special guests and different thing. We'll be tackling a lot of different topics. We love you guys. Thank you so much for checking it out and we'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.